Morning, Creekside. Welcome to Easter Part Two. Uh, yeah, Easter 2.0. Um, before we jump into our singing part of our worship time, um, I just want to invite you to uh, use your posture to communicate to the Lord. Um, you know, we're here to worship the Most High God, El Elyon, the the Almighty, El Shaddai, and. Uh, uh, if you, if you will, let's stand together and honor him. If you need to sit, that, you know, sit when you need to. But let's, let's stand up and, and get into uh, worship with um, worshiping the Most High God. Uh, another name I'd like to mention is Elohe Yeshuati, God of our salvation, God of my salvation. We're going to sing about that salvation now. Spring up from the ground, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. Seek the lost and heal the lame. Jesus, bring glory to your name. Let all the prodigals run home. All of creation waits and groans. Lord, have heard of your great fame. Father, cause all to shout your name. Salvation. Salvation spring up from the ground, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. Seek the lost and heal the lame, Jesus, bring glory to your name. Let all the prodigals run home, all of creation waits and groans. Lord, we've heard of your great fame, Father, cause all to shout your name. Shout to me, salvation spring up from the ground, Lord, in the heavens and come down. Seek the lost and heal the lame, Jesus, bring glory to your name. Let all the prodigals run home, all of creation waits and groans. Lord, we've heard of your great fame, Father, cause all to shout your name. Salvation spring up from the ground. 
Welcome to our second Easter service. We're glad to have you all here. And in the spirit of fellowship, if you'd like to greet each other by shaking hands, elbow bumps, fist bumps, 
our hugs. Please feel free to do so, and we welcome those of you who may be here for the first time. Um, just introduce yourself and join.
Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you feel the people tremble? Do you feel the darkness tremble? He is risen. Pursue us, the power of the resurrection that shows that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the Lord and King of the universe. And Father, now we just want to draw near to you. We're overwhelmed by the privilege that we have to approach you without shame and approach you boldly. Right now we just want to lean closer to you and to your heart. We want to know you better. It's in your name we pray. Lift up our voices. Amen. The more I seek you, It's more than I can stand 
this morning. And Father, we pray for the power of your resurrection in our lives. Revive our hearts. Fill our families, our homes, and our church with the power of your resurrection, your life, and your peace in our hearts. We stand and sit and sing in honor of you. It's in your name we, we gather and pray and sing this morning. Hey, y'all. Thanks for indulging me with Easter part two. No more difficult place for a pastor to be on Easter morning than sitting home on his couch coughing his head off. I, uh, the more I talk, the more likely I am to start coughing. So I told myself this morning, don't sing the songs. It'll only make you cough. It's hard not to sing in a room full of people singing. So good to be with you. Um, Let me take a moment. Would you join me? Lord, um, it's good to sing the gospel. It's good to sing your love. 
It's good to sing prayers of your kingdom and to pray for your kingdom to come. We do pray for the day when that Isaiah described that salvation will spring up from the ground, <laughs> when you will rend the heavens, when final healing will take place, when the vulnerable, the poor will get justice, and um, your kingdom come, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, we sing the songs and we realize we're just, we're part of something so much bigger than what's going on in this world around us. Um, we're part of something eternal that the kingdoms of this world can't match. And um, we praise you for that, and we just pray that um, today would be just one more time when you help us to get our story lined up with your story um, so that our lives' chapters are going the way your chapters are going. Um, help us to confess, help us to repent, help us to trust, help us to rejoice, help us to follow Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So when I was a little kid, our house was the very last house in the street. And so our home was, was surrounded by woods and cow pastures. It was the most delightful place the kid could grow up. And um, moved in there, I guess I was about four or five. It was before kindergarten. Um, but behind our house, there, there was this cow pasture. And out in the middle of the cow pasture, there was a single wide trailer. Um, and when I say in the middle of the cow pasture, literally there was no road going out there. There was no path. It was as if a single wide trailer just fell from the sky, landed in the middle of a cow pasture, and there was this little old man that lived out there. I could look out my kitchen window and see him out there. I could be in my backyard and see him out there. And on a regular basis, I don't know if it was every day or how often, but on a very regular basis, um, this little old man would walk out on his front stoop of his single wide trailer in the middle of the cow pasture, and he would open a Bible, and he would start preaching to no one in general. Um, we were the closest house. He was probably 100, 150 yards from my back porch. Um, and he would just walk out, cows going by, birds in the trees, sun shining, and he would just be preaching at the top of his lungs. No pulpit, just standing there with his Bible open. Little old me thinking, well, that's kind of strange. <laughs> There's a man in the cow pasture preaching. Um, <laughs> And I don't, you know, I was talking to my mom about this because I was like, I'm pretty sure this happened. She's like, I hadn't thought of that man in years. I remember him. He would preach in front of his trailer. And so, um, and then at some point, and I don't know when, I, neither of us could remember, first grade, second grade, you look up one day, the trailer's not there, the man's gone. It's as if the trailer went back to heaven, and that was that. <laughs> God was done with him. Um, Strange memory, interesting memory, but I, I thought of that a lot as I was looking at 1 Corinthians 15 and thinking about Easter because I asked myself the question, um, was that old man in the cow pasture that I have no idea who he was, my mom doesn't know who he was, um, was he wasting his time? Rhetorical question. Was he wasting his time? Or to use biblical terminology, was he... Was he preaching in vain? Was his preaching an empty, pointless pursuit? Out there with the cows and the possums. Um, I thought about that a lot. Um, I don't even know what he was preaching. Couldn't really hear him well from my house. I like to think he was out there preaching the gospel. Um, but, but was that an empty thing that he did? And the conclusion I come to is that the one thing that I believe would have made that a waste of his time is the same thing that would make our proclamation of Scripture a waste of time. Um, the thing that makes our serving, whether we're working in sound and video or with kids or loving our neighbors or whatever it is we're doing to serve the Lord, our labor in the Lord, um, the same thing that would make that man's labor pointless is actually the very same thing that would make our labor pointless, and I don't know that any of us like to think of our labor as being pointless, but there is a way that it could be. And um, 
Easter speaks to that, 1 Corinthians 15 speaks to that. And I, I don't know that I could think of a more um, sad thing than that we would just look at it all and say, well, well that's pointless. But the flip side side's true is that if it's not pointless, then it's full of meaning. It's full of potential. It's full of, of power. So 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has been... Um, it's a difficult place, Corinth. It's a dark place, pagan place. Uh, we'll see one of their favorite sayings, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow we die, kind of place. And the church was filled with division um, over spiritual gifts. You can see this as you read through Lord's Supper and spiritual gifts and which gifts are most important and people using this gift, thinking they're better than these people who use this gift, and he's just going on and, and prophecy and tongues and all this stuff, and the, the, the worship is all out of order, and he's trying to get, to get them back to unity. And then he says, <clears throat> but let me remind you, as I come to the end of my letter, um, of the most important thing. Let me get back to the message, and he says at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 1, <clears throat> now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. So Paul was never hesitant to remind people of something he had already said. As a matter of fact, he told the Philippian church, it's good that I say this again. So um, if you feel like the Bible is repetitive sometimes, it's because it is, because we need to be reminded. And he said, I just want to remind you of the gospel, the good news that I preached to you. <clears throat> and you have received the gospel, he says, and you've taken your stand in the gospel. In other words, you've, you've put all your cards, all your chips, all your hope in this gospel message. So let me just remind you that that's where you stand, and let me remind you that that's the most important thing I gave you. He's going to say in a second. <clears throat> and by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. So he's saying, the um, interesting little tense of verb here, by this gospel, you're being saved as you hold fast to it. So he's saying there, there are people who are coming to Christ through the gospel message who are being saved, and then there are people who have been saved who are still being saved by the power of the gospel. They're, they're being saved from the power of sin in their lives by the gospel. And so there are people who can say, I've been saved and I'm being saved, and then there are still people coming to Christ. So the gospel is saving people, and as they hold to the word, he's preached. And then he adds this little note here. Um, otherwise, or unless, maybe your translation says, you have believed in vain. In other words, unless you believed for no good reason, unless your belief was empty or pointless. Which is fascinating, because, I mean, if you've been here for a couple of years, we went through the Gospel of John. How many, John, how many times did Jesus use the word believe? Like a hundred times? He's always calling people to believe, believe, believe. And now here's Paul saying, well, you may have believed in vain. This, this, it may have been pointless that you believed. And there are two ways that Paul can go after that statement. As a matter of fact, if you, there are some Bible translations that go ahead and pick the way for you. I noticed as I was looking at them. Um, one of the ways would be that you believed in vain because you really didn't believe. So Paul will spend the rest of the chapter telling you how to really, really believe and make sure you believe and make sure you believe enough and make sure you believe the right way and that makes you just make sure you really believe, right? This isn't some fanciful thing. This isn't just some little shadow that went by and you believed, but you didn't really believe and Paul could spend the rest of the chapter doing that. Um, <clears throat> but he doesn't. He takes a, the second option. And the way believing can be an empty thing is if what you believe isn't true. Not all faith is in a trustworthy object. Not all belief is in something worthy of that belief. We don't take our stand necessarily on everything sometimes that isn't worth taking a stand in. And that's the direction he's going to go. And I think Scripture does this a lot. I don't think Scripture is always just saying, believe, 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 believe. I think Scripture holds us up something beautifully trustworthy, and we go, oh, really, I want to trust that, right? And, and that's what Paul does, and he says, I passed on to you as of first importance. So this is at the top of my list. After all these chapters of dealing with this stuff, Corinthians, let me get back to the very first thing. 
Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And he was buried, and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And so Paul, even with scripture he had, even with his Hebrew scriptures we call the Old Testament, um, he could look at the death and resurrection of Christ and say, ah, that's just exactly as scripture said. Um, God is really good that he gives divine commentary on historical events. Um, we could just say, I mean, and it, it, any historian can tell you that there was a guy named Jesus he lived. He was an itinerant rabbi, probably maybe a miracle worker, and um, the Romans crucified him on a Roman cross, and he was buried, and um, the tomb was empty. Any historian could tell you that. But then God comes along and said, oh, no, this is, this is the Christ. This is the Savior. He's dying for your sin. Just as I said, I mean, even Peter wrote in his, one of his letters, we mention him right now, that the prophets didn't even really realize fully what they were saying when they preached the salvation that was coming. He said even angels were looking, wanting to look into this. So this is first importance. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised. And after that, he appeared to more, or excuse me, and then he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Though some had fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and the, to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles. Do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul says, there's all these people around. If, 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 if you want to know, you can go ask them. So this is a, a matter of history. And he appeared to all these people. And then he says, I was late born. I was in the womb longer than the other ones were. Um, I was out trying to kill the church when Jesus showed up to me. And so I was kind of the last in line apostle. Um, I'm late born. I'm the least. I don't even deserve it. I persecuted the church that I'm now trying to serve. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace to me was not without effect. I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. But whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. So, you see what he does. He's not saying, you believed in vain, now believe right this time. He's saying, you believed in vain if this message isn't true. And in particular, if Jesus Christ was not raised. And that's verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how come some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So that's what will make the proclamation of the word of God useless as if Jesus is still dead and there's no resurrection. And that's what would make your faith just an empty, vain pursuit is if the one you're trusting isn't alive to be trusted. A dead Savior doesn't do anyone any good. And so apparently there's someone coming to the church and saying, no one gets raised. This life is all you get. YOLO, you only live once. Get it. And it's, we're done. There's no resurrection. There's nothing after this. So if there's no resurrection, then... There's no resurrection of Jesus. There's no resurrection of Jesus and no resurrection of us. And our preachings lie. More than that, we're found to be false witnesses about God because we testified that God raised Jesus from the dead. So we're lying about God because we said God did that. For we have testified God raised Christ from the dead. And if he didn't raise him, if the fact the dead aren't raised, for if the dead are not raised, Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Futile, the best way to say it, to be honest with you. Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they're lost. So if Christ is dead and you're in Christ, you're dead. And you're in your sin. Christ didn't do anything for your sins. He's still dead. You're still in your sin. All those people who died believing that you know, yeah, they're just dead. 
this, this stuff about, oh, I'll get to see them one day. He says, no, if Christ is still dead, you won't see anybody. You'll just get eaten by worms, and that'll be that. There's, there's no part of you that's going to keep going. So stop preaching it. And there's this line, verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Now, I come from the south where men in trailers preach in the middle of cow pastures. Um, and there's, this, there's this sentiment in the south, and I've heard this, I still see this, that goes something like this. You know what? If I get to the end of my life and I find out that all of this is a lie, I've still had a good life. If I get to the end of my life, well, you know, I've had good friends and, and I find out God isn't real and I'm just worm food and, you know, they're all the resurrection and the gospel. If all that wasn't true, it's okay, I've had a good life. And Paul says, no, you're pitiful. You're pitiful because you spent your entire life believing a lie. And you know what? You had one shot at this world and you, you should have just went for it and you didn't go for it. You pitiful person. You spent your life. Yeah, that sentiment <laughs> needs to die. Yeah. If this is all there is in this life, it's pitiful. Because Jesus is dead. There's nothing else. So if Easter isn't real, part one or part two, um, <laughs> we're a pitiful bunch and our faith is in vain. Fortunately, we have verse 20, which starts with, but Christ, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Um, between one of my years of college, I can't remember which one, but um, went back home and I spent the summer working at a little Baptist mission in a government housing project in Knoxville, Montgomery Village housing project. And um, the Baptists had bought this little house that was on a corner, like in the, in the projects. Um, and they had renovated it, and it was where people would come for Bible studies and to get a drink of water and to get groceries and to get help. And we were just there ministering to people all day. And um, up the hill from us, there was, I don't know what to call this except to say that it was like a commune of some sort where everybody just kind of lived together and shared everything in common. And um, there was this one guy, I don't know if they were all Christians, I don't know, who would come down the hill, and he would just hang out with us some. And uh, he would go into downtown Knoxville once a week to a place that sold rags, and he would buy rags for a penny apiece. And then he would go back to the commune, and he would sit at the sewing machine, and he would make T-shirts out of the rags. Real hippie-ish, very cool. Um, <laughs> But he would come down to see us, and one day we're sitting in the kitchen, and he walks in, um, excuse me, and in the paper bag, he, he pulls out on the table a couple of tomatoes, some cucumbers, some peppers, I can't remember what all, and he says, um, God tells me I'm supposed to give the, the first fruits of my crop to him. I didn't know how else to do that but to bring it to you. So... <laughs> Cool. We're honored. We're humbled by that. Um, this is the first fruits, and, and that's you know what you read in your Old Testaments. The first part comes in. You offer that to the Lord, and that's your way of saying, "I'm trusting you that there's going to be more. There's going to be more tomatoes, <laughs> more cucumbers, right?" And he says, "Christ is the first fruits. He, his resurrection is guaranteeing that there's going to be more resurrections. He's, he's the first one." death came through a man, that's Adam. Resurrection comes through a man. In Adam, everybody dies. In Christ, we get raised. Christ, the first fruits, and when he comes, those who belong to him. So Adam is the default position. When you come into the world, when you're born into this world, the, the checkbox next to Adam is checked. It's automatic. So in Adam, you die with Adam. When you get in Christ, you get into resurrection. 
and he goes first, and then we follow in. And he says, and then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So he's, there's not going to be any rule that, that he's not over. He's just going to get rid of anything that opposes him, anyone that opposes him. He will reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. So there won't be any, anyone opposing Christ. And then it says, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So that he will be all in all. The last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Death will die. Not of natural causes. <laughs> It'll be destroyed. Can, can, you, can you get your brain around death dying? Death will be defeated. Be destroyed. I mean... Praise God for scientists. Praise God for doctors who give their lives away to figuring out cures to our worst diseases. I, nobody has ever stood at the stoplight or come to my door or pitched on television that, that scientists are looking for a cure for death. <laughs> We've almost got it cured. Nope. The ratio is still one to one. Everybody's still dying. Um, Thank God for people who work hard on diseases. Jesus will destroy death because he destroyed his own death by rising from the dead. So it goes on to talk because people have questions. Well, what will that be like? What kind of bodies will we have, right? He said, it'll be like when you plant a seed in the ground. The kind of seed you plant is the kind of plant you get. And so you'll sow a natural body, but you'll get a spiritual body and you're sown in weakness, but you'll be raised in, in power. You'll, you, you'll be buried in dishonor, raised in glory, right? And he goes through all of describing that. It's just kind of the picture. You know the song, Spring is Coming? I don't know if you remember that song when, when Stephen Curtis Chapman had to bury his little girl, and he had just heard a sermon on this, and he's like, well, I'll just, I put a seed in the ground. But spring's coming. Spring's coming. And there will be a harvest, and I will see a daughter again. Flesh and blood, he says, can't enter, inherit the kingdom, and the perishable will not inherit the imperishable. So we're going we're to have to figure out a way to get out of this suit and to get something imperishable, to go into an imperishable kingdom led by the imperishable, incomparable, death-defeating Jesus. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death swallowed up in victory. I've, this is, we love Alan Bryant here. He comes and preaches for us. But I, I talked to him this week and I said, Alan, I'm, I'm using my favorite Alan Bryant quote this week. He's like, 1 Corinthians 15, yeah, death is swallowed up in victory, you know. Alan has that saying that, I'll, I'll just let you ask Alan next time he comes. What happens when you swallow something? It comes out the other end, right? That's what Jesus did to death. <laughs> he swallowed it up. Death always wins, doesn't it? No, it's not. And you follow this backwards. He says, the law gives sin its power. The law just says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, do this. And then we've got this weakness inside of us and this sinfulness inside of us. And we, it's just like the law is just telling us the stuff we're going to do anyway. And then when sin brings death, and so it's like every, every time you break the law and every time there's sin, it's just a reminder of death. We carry death. That's what Paul said. It's like I've got death inside of me. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory over sin, victory over death, 
he abolishes the law, he fulfills the law, he abolishes the law, so you're not under law, you're under grace. Death is defeated. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Keep standing where you're standing. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know, here it is, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not empty. It's not worthless. It's not a waste of time. So, so this, this, would, this would primarily be, I guess, a half a negative message because if you're asking the question, what if Easter isn't real? What if Christ isn't raised? Well, then all of these things are empty pursuits. Right? You're just believing something that's not true. Um, but there's the positive side of that is that if Christ is raised, well, then there's all these positive things that are true, right? So you can think of people who've fallen asleep in Christ as alive, right? Um, I think when I, when I talk to the kids in my worldview class and I ask them, um, what about this do you look forward to? These are high school juniors and seniors, right? And... Um, I don't know. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in a place to think about eternal things when I was a teenager, but it always strikes me when teenagers spend time thinking about heaven, you know, because you feel invincible, I guess, a bit. But when I hear teenagers say, well, what I'm looking forward to is, you know, like seeing my mom who died when I was seven, or I look, for, <laughs> I look forward to this, this body that lets me down, I look forward to this being rid of sin. Right, there's something positive there. But then you just realize all the things that Jesus said that would be silly if he didn't plan to come alive again. Whoever loses their life for my sake in the gospel will find it. Only somebody that knows they're going to rise from the dead would say something like that. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? The Corinthians were saying, dude, forget about your soul, gain the world. <laughs> right? But if you know you're going to come to life, <laughs> you can say, lose your life, lose the world, gain your soul. Only someone who knows that there's a kingdom coming where death dies would say, Seek first the kingdom of God and let him take care of everything else. And what did Jesus say? Because the pagans run after that stuff. So the pagans in Corinth were saying, no, run after the stuff. Get the stuff. Jesus is saying, no, get the kingdom. And just let me take care of the stuff. Because you don't really need that much stuff. So I go back to that man in the field, out there with his Bible and his trailer, preaching up a storm. Um, and I go, well, if Jesus is dead, he's wasting his time preaching to the cows. Not that the cows are going to be in heaven because he preached to them, but <laughs> nonetheless, whoever that man was, his heart was burning with a message. He was kind of a Jeremiah kind of guy, right? I can't keep this in. So I'll just step on my front stoop and yell to whoever's nearby, which was not really anybody. But I just think of that, and I think, um, is labor in the Lord not in vain? What kind of reward does a guy like that get? I don't know what the rest of his life was like. I know how it ended <laughs> on the trailer in the pasture. Um, but I just wonder, you know, if you're that passionate about something you've taken your stand in, and you've bet your life on it, and it proves out Jesus is alive and it's all true, then I guess his labor in the Lord is not in vain. Who am I to say, right? But I just want to encourage you. Um, labor in the Lord has um, it's been very different for the last year, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been hard. It's been difficult. What am I supposed to be doing, Right? Can't be having neighbors over and can't be going sitting at my table at Starbucks and talking to lost people and encouraging my friends and 
counseling people. And, but whatever it is you're doing in the Lord, however it is you're loving your neighbor, however it is you're serving in the church, can I just encourage you that it's, it's the opposite of whatever vain is, which Paul says is not in vain. I know that's not the proper way the English teacher would let us do that, but what's the opposite of vain? Not in vain. <laughs> Full, purposeful, good. You're not wasting your time, brothers and sisters. You're not wasting your time serving the Lord in your home with your kids and with your husband or with your wife or just you, whoever it is. You're not wasting your time because Jesus is alive to guarantee that you're not wasting your time, right? So this, this is a good time to think. I realize we're, we still have masks and I realize COVID's still there and we, we, we try our best not to think. Yay, it's all done. Woohoo. Um, but it does seem the world is changing a bit. And um, maybe this is just a good time to just be thinking about. Jesus is alive. I'm alive in Christ. I can seek his kingdom first. And it's not a purposeless thing. It's full and freeing and victorious. Um, Lord, how can I labor in you? How can I stand firm? How can I not be moved? And this could come across as law. Try harder, but even Paul said, I worked harder than everybody, but it was just great. It was grace in me. It was grace in me. So maybe it's just a way of saying, Jesus, you're alive. Give me grace to keep standing. Give me grace to keep laboring. Give me grace to keep serving. And I will let you take care of the not in vain part. Because if you can swallow death and send it out the other end, if you can do that, then you can certainly guarantee that I am not wasting my time here with this message or with this ministry. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Who else, who else can do this? Nobody goes in a grave and comes out. But you do, Jesus. You do. And so we proclaim and we serve and we give our lives away and we realize we don't have to gain the whole world and we can seek the kingdom first. So I, I pray for my brothers and sisters. We've, we've been through a trying, tiring time. The word labor just doesn't even sound good. It sounds tiring. <laughs> and And... We've grieved. If there's anything that's happened over the last year, it's that we've grieved so much loss. Lord, just, just reading this week, 40,000 kids under the age of 17 lost a parent to COVID. 40 thousand kids grieving one less parent we live in sad trying days Lord and so we serve you and we take our stand in something real we take our stand in the one who is victorious and so for my brothers and sisters in this room and those listening um, on the internet, Lord, um, help them to bring you their weakness. Help them to bring you their tiredness. Help them to bring you their grief. Help them to bring you their guilt, their shame, their what's next. Help them to bring it all to you and to know that you're victorious and gracious. And may we, in the coming days, just enter into a new season of proclamation of the gospel, of ministry, and the small things, the big things, the medium things. Just a new season of giving our lives away and finding life. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen, y'all. Thank you. Good to see you today. Have a great week.